In Psalm 92 and verse 10, I read, But my horn shall thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Three times David was anointed king of Israel. When David was a lad tending the sheep in the wilderness, we find in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 13, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him. In 2 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 4, we read, And the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. David was anointed king for the third time. In 2 Samuel chapter 5 and verse 3, And they anointed David king over Israel. No wonder David could say, I shall be anointed with fresh oil. For three times David was anointed king over Israel. We too, as God's people, should say with the king of old, I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, for these moments we enter into one of the most sacred and holy doctrines of the Word of God. That amazing truth of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. I pray for those who hear and those who see that the Holy Spirit of God shall so control this preacher and those who hear that we shall be aware of being anointed, as was David of old, with fresh oil. Control these lips, this mind, this heart, and the ears and minds and hearts of those who hear Make this a never-to-be-forgotten moment for each of us. In Jesus' name, amen. David said, I shall be anointed with fresh oil. As a child, growing up in the southwest section of Dallas, Texas, I was reared in the home of an alcoholic. My mother and father were very, very poor. We had the usual measures of poverty and circumstances of the Depression days. I was a very nervous child. I can recall going to the Fernwood Baptist Church of Dallas years ago, becoming nervous in the services, and mother would have to take me outside because I was trembling and weeping. I shall not forget the day when my father and mother called me to the front room of our little two-room shack one, one, Sunday, one Monday morning. And my mother said, Son, your father is leaving our home today. And I said, Why, Mother? Why, Daddy? And my, and my mother said, Son, sin, especially alcohol, has broken our home. And your father will not be living with us anymore. I got on my knees and looked up at Dad and said, Daddy, wouldn't you rather have me than a bottle of whiskey? And my dad turned and walked away, never to live in our little apartment again. My mother walked two miles to a public school and worked for 50 cents a day and walked two miles home to keep food, a little bit of food, on the table. And enough clothes on my back to keep me warm and shoes to keep my feet dry. That's the kind of childhood that I had. When I was a teenage lad, senior in high school, I felt the call of God to preach the gospel. But nobody took me seriously. They called me Little Jackie Boy. I was an introvert. I sucked my thumb till I was 14 years of age. Everybody... Call me the little Jackie boy. On my 17th birthday, I weighed 92 pounds, dripping wet and full of bananas. Just a little bitty runt of a kid. We had two blocks from us, living a, an all-American football player named Joe Boyd. Joe Boyd was the first string tackle on the Associated Press 
All-American football team. He was the hero of all the neighborhood. My, he weighed 235. I weighed 92. He was six foot three, and I was about three foot six, and uh, he was my hero. And I recall one Sunday in the services, down the aisle walked old Joe Boyd, and he said, Pastor, God's called me to preach the gospel. And ah, oh, the pastor said, ladies and gentlemen, I have some good news for you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Joe Boyd is surrendering his life to preach the gospel. All-American football player, heavyweight boxing champion of Texas A&M College, heavyweight wrestling champion of the same school. Ladies and gentlemen, Joe Boyd has been called to preach. The chairman of the deacon board said, praise the Lord. One lady said, hallelujah. One lady said, glory to God, Joe Boyd has been called to preach. I looked up to God and I said, dear God, that's the one I'd have called if I'd have been you. You sure made a wise choice today. Three months to the day after Joe Boyd was called to preach, I was sitting in the Hillcrest Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas, when God said to me, Jack, I want you to be a preacher too. And I said, Lord, nobody will take that seriously. If I walk down the aisle, they'll criticize you and me too, you for calling me and me for surrendering. And the Lord said, Jack, I want you to be a preacher. I tiptoed very timidly with my introversion toward the altar and said to the pastor, Brother Sizemore, God has called me to preach the gospel. I'll never forget what he said. He said, Jackie boy, are you sure? And I said, yes, sir, I'm sure. He stood before the people and said, folks, before I tell you what's happened today, I want to remind you that God is a miracle-working God. God parted the Red Sea, caused the sun to stand still, and fed the 5,000 with a few loaves and fishes. And God can do miracles. He was preparing the people for the announcement that little Jackie boy had surrendered to preach the gospel. When he said that Jackie boy has been called to preach, nobody said amen. Nobody said hallelujah. Nobody said praise the Lord. Several folks said Oh, my. But Jackie Boy did surrender to preach the gospel. I was invited to speak at a church on a Wednesday night. The pastor was on vacation. The pastor said, I'd like you to supply for me on Wednesday night while I'm away on vacation. I didn't know you had to study. I thought the Lord told you what to say when you preached. I'll never forget when I was sitting behind the pulpit and the deacon chairman stood and said, Ladies and gentlemen, our pastor's on vacation, but we have a guest speaker, Reverend Jack Hiles, a young man who's going to speak for us. He said, I'll never forget. He said, we're all waiting to hear what God has laid on Jack's heart. And I said to myself, I don't know whether he's waiting to hear what God laid on my heart or not, but I know I'm waiting to hear what God laid on my heart. Did you know God forgot to lay anything on my heart? I stuttered and stammered and apologized for three minutes and sat down in failure and futility. The deacon chairman stood up and he said, Ladies and gentlemen, I thought the fellow could preach, but I apologized. The pastor said he was a preacher. I sat down and the people came by one by one. And my best friend said to me, Jack, you'd better not go through with this preaching business. You will never make it. And one by one said the same thing. But God had called me. When God calls, He qualifies. Preach I must and preach I did. I went off to college. I was called to a small college church, 100 miles from East Texas Baptist College of Marshall, Texas. My salary was $7.50 a week. I drove 100 miles up to the church on a Sunday, preached, drove back after the service on Sunday night. For one solid year, I preached in that church. Not one single person walked the aisle. Nobody was saved. Nobody came for baptism. Nobody came for church membership. For one year, not one single move. I thought I'd die. Just a country preacher, a complete failure. I recall one time preaching in Waco, Texas, and uh, just before I had gotten in there, Dr. John R. Rice had preached there, and Dr. Lee Robertson had preached in the area, and so had Dr. J. Harold Smith, three very well-known preachers. I preached one night, and one little fellow walked up after the service, and he said, Brother Hiles, I heard Dr. Rice and I heard Dr. Robertson, 
And I heard Dr. Smith. But he said, you did more for me than all three of those put together. Well, I thought, my, I must be a better preacher than I thought I was. Dr. Tom Malone says that a preacher is like a wasp. He's bigger right after he's hatched than any other time in his life. And I said, son, uh, you, th- you like me better than John Rice and Lee Robertson and J. Harold Smith? And he said, that's right. You did more for me than all three of those put together. And I said, well, what did you like best about me, son? And he said, when I heard Dr. Rice, I said, I never could be that smart. When I heard Dr. Robertson, I said, I never could be that handsome. When I heard Dr. J. Harold Smith, I said, I never could be that dynamic. But when I heard you, I said, bless God, if he can do it, anybody ought to be able to do it. And the truth is, anybody can do it. But there's a secret to doing it. And I'd like to share with you in this message on fresh oil of that secret. I said a while ago for one year I preached. Not one single convert. Nobody walked the aisle. Nobody got saved. Nobody came for dedication of life. Not one single person for a whole year. What a lonely year it was. I can recall going out behind the church after the service and crying and saying, Oh, God, what's it going to take for me to have production and and me to have results? What's it going to take? And I'd go back and preach again the next Sunday and again a dry hall, no response, no one coming forward, no conversions. And I said, oh God, what's wrong? I've got to have something to help me. For a long, lonely, miserable year, I preached. Finally, I began to lose weight. My family came and said, you better take care of yourself. You're going to get bad sick. I lost over 25 pounds, begging God to do something to give me power. I went to the East Texas Baptist College Library. I began to read the the biographies of great men. And as I read the biographies, I was searching for one common denominator that all the great men of God had. And I thought I found it. I read about how Dwight L. Moody was walking down Wall Street one day, and all of a sudden the power of God came on him. He had to seek refuge in the home of a friend and beg for God to withhold himself for a while until he could be alone. And Dwight L. Moody said his life was never the same. His ministry, he said he preached the same sermon. He preached before, had five converts, and now he has 50. He'd use the same outline he used to use when he had 10 converts, and now he has 100. And Mr. Moody said all of a sudden his life was transformed. And as a kid preacher, the pine thickets of East Texas... Walking up and down the sand hills, I would say, Oh, God, is that thing that you had for Moody available for little Jack Hiles? A little quiet, introverted country preacher? Is whatever Moody got, is that available for Jack Hiles? As I continued my pursuit of the bi- biographies of the East Texas Baptist College Library, I read the story of Savonarola, who one day went to the pulpit to preach. But there was no power. He sat there, it says, for five hours, refusing to preach, sitting in the chair, right to the pulpit, until the power of God would come on him. He said, I will not be a powerless preacher. I will not preach in the flesh. For five hours, he said, for five hours the people waited, until finally the breath of God settled on him, and something supernatural took over. My heart began to burn on the inside as I realized there was something this little country preacher did not have, that thing that makes a man of God what he ought to be. And I continued reading, and I continued praying. I read about Christmas Evans, the famous old preacher born on Christmas Day, a one-eyed preacher because his one eye was put out by a stone hurled by a friend, so-called, on the day of his conversion. Christmas Evans tells how he was riding his horse one day on his circuit. All of a sudden, the power of God came on him. He fell off his horse and got on his knees beside the horse. And the Holy Spirit of God came into his life, and he was never the same. I read about Charles G. Penny, the power of God that was on his life. He could walk into a schoolroom, and folks would begin to cry, What must I do to be saved? He could walk into a factory, and folks would begin to weep and say, help me find God. I read about John Wesley, who said that on October the 3rd, 1738, he and several preachers had been praying all through the night 
And about three o'clock in the morning, all of a sudden, there was the power of God that came on him. And the great Methodist movement was started back when the power of God was on that great movement. I read about George Fox, who tried everything to get peace and power. And finally, for two weeks, he went along with God, fasted, prayed, was in some sort of a trance. And those who heard him preach when he came back said he was never the same. I read about Peter Cartwright and his fullness of the Spirit. I read about George Whitfield, who said that on June 20, 1736, he was ordained to preach the gospel. Bishop Benson laid his hands on him. When Bishop Benson's hands were laid on George Whitfield, he said something happened. There was such a yielding of himself to the Holy Spirit that he knew for the first time in his life he was filled with the Holy Spirit. My heart began to burn as a little country preacher, just a kid of a boy. I began to burn inside as I would sit in that library and read those biographies. I was trying to find something that preachers had that God had blessed that I did not have. Back to my pulpit I'd go. Preach again. No results again. And back to my pulpit again. Preach again. No results again. And finally I got the Cruden's Concordance. And I found every scripture I could on the Holy Spirit. And I got in my Bible and I bathed myself in the Word of God. I must have what Moody had. I must have what Wesley had. I must have what Spurgeon had. I must have this mighty power of God. And I began to search the Scriptures to see what the Scriptures said about the Holy Spirit. I read in Judges 6 and 34 where it says the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. And in Judges 14, 6, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson. And in 1 Samuel 11, verse 6, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Saul. And in 1 Samuel 16, 13, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David. In Acts 9, and verse 17, I read that the Apostle Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit. And then I read in Luke 4, verse 1, that even Jesus, my Savior, was filled with the Holy Spirit. I didn't understand what I was seeking, but I knew there was something I did not have. I knew that I was preaching in the flesh. I knew the power of God was not upon me. And I began to read the Scriptures. Luke 3.16, He shall baptize you with fire and with the Holy Ghost. Acts 1.4, spoke of the promise of the Father. Luke 24.49, mentioned the endowment of power. Acts 1.8 says, After the Holy Ghost has come, upon you. In Acts 2, 7, I read about the pouring out of the Holy Ghost. Ephesians 5, 18, And be ye not drunk with wine where it is excess, but be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. Now I began to search. Could it be for me, a little old East Texas preacher, just a little runt of a fella, introverted, untalented, and yet with all of my soul, I wanted to be a man of God. I had seen so much sham in the church. I had seen so much powerlessness in the pulpit. I had seen so many substitutes for the real thing. And I said, God, I'm not going to be a powerless preacher. I came to Isaiah 40, 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Night after night, I would seek refuge in the pine thickets of East Texas. Night after night, I'd fall on my face among the pine needles on the sand hills of East Texas, out in the woods, crying, Oh, God, I'm not going to be a powerless preacher. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I've got to have, whatever this is, I've got to have the power of God. And let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, the great need for this nation is spirit-filled preachers. Men of God with a supernatural touch upon their lives. Men who know what it is to be endued with the power of God. Men with a message from heaven and the power from heaven to turn this nation back to God. I cried. I prayed. I begged. If you had driven down Highway 43 between Marshall, Texas and Henderson, Texas, most any night, you could have heard some little voice crying out in the woods, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? 
Where is the Lord God of Elijah? On May 12, 1950, the sun came up that morning with a kid preacher on his face, having prayed in the woods all night long, tears streaming down my cheeks. And I said, Oh, God, whatever it is, I'm willing to pay the price. I'm willing to do what I have to do to have the power of God upon my life. And on my face, I cried, I surrender all. I didn't know what I was saying. I didn't know what it meant. I got off my knees, went to our little country parsonage, freshened up, went down to radio station KMHT in Marshall, Texas, and preached on my morning broadcast from 9 to 9.30, Went back to my study and then to my house. I was sitting in the living room reading, reading the Dallas Morning News when the phone rang. Hello, this is the parsonage, I said. The operator said, is this Reverend Jack Hiles? I said, this is Brother Hiles. She said, go ahead, sir. And a man's voice said, my name is Smith. I'm, I'm a friend of your dad. Reverend Hiles, your dad just dropped dead with a heart attack. And I said, dear Lord, I didn't mean that. That's not what I meant. I didn't mean take my daddy. I got in my car, drove to the O'Neill Funeral Home in Dallas, Texas. By the way, the same funeral home that embalmed the late President Kennedy. I followed a hearse to a little cemetery in Italy, Texas where I was born, where my daddy and mother used to live, and operate a small country grocery store. We laid my daddy's body in a little grave near a creek in a cemetery just outside of Italy, Texas. I took the family back after the service, service the graveside service. I went back to the grave. I threw my face on the grave. And face down, I said, Dear God, I'm not leaving this grave till you do something for me. I'm a powerless preacher. My own father sat in the services twice and heard his own son preach, and his own son was powerless. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got to have the power of God upon preachers of this land if this nation knows deliverance from judgment. And I stayed, and I stayed. And I stayed. I do not know how long I stayed. But I promised God that I was not leaving till something happened to me. My friends said I stayed several days. While I was on my father's grave, blessed be God, he did a work in my life. I've not been the same since. I am not perfect. I'm not sanctified. I have not yet apprehended, but blessed be God, there has not been one single Sunday since that day on May 13, 1950, when my dad's body was laid in the grave. Not one single Sunday have I lived without seeing conversions. We have four children. Our oldest daughter is 29. Not one single child in the Hiles family has ever gone to church on Sunday without seeing somebody baptized. You say, you must be a great preacher. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. For one year, I preached a powerless ministry. For one year, I did not know this amazing power of God. But thank God, for these wonderful years, God's blessing and God's power have been known by a little introvert reared in the home of an alcoholic in poverty, and that same power is available for you. It may not come upon you as it came upon Moody on Wall Street. It may not happen to you as it happened to, to George Whitfield at his ordination service. It may be that you just fall on your face and keep praying for power, and you will see a change in your ministry. 
It may be that you'll see a change in your Sunday school class, in your bus route, in the rearing of your children. Inside this Bible here, I have the words written, pray for power. On my mirror where I shave at home and in my office where I shave, I have the words printed and pasted on the mirror, pray for power. On the windshield of my car, I have the words pasted there, pray for power. Inside my briefcase, I have the words pasted, pray for power. On my desk at home, I have a big uh, piece of wood where it's burned across the wood, pray for power. I pray for the power of God 10,000 times a week. While I shave, I say, oh God, give me power, give me power, give me power. While I drive down the street, I say, oh God, give me power, give me power. As I sit at my desk, I say, oh God, give me power, give me power. First thing I do when I wake up in the morning is pray for the Holy Spirit to use me that day. After I finish my breakfast, I pray the same prayer. In mid-morning, I pray the same prayer. After my lunch, I pray the same prayer. At mid-afternoon, I pray the same prayer. After dinner, I pray the same prayer. Before I go to bed at night, I pray the same prayer. The old country preacher was praying one day, Oh, Lord, give me the unction. Give me the unction. Give me the unction. Somebody came up and said, Man, what is the unction? The old country preacher said, I don't know what it is, but I know what it ain't. And I'm talking to Christians today. You you don't know what it is, but you know what it ain't. And because we know what it ain't, is what's wrong with this country. Oh, for some men of God and churches of God, where people come and they say with the people of old, surely our hearts did burn within us as he talked with us. Now, here's the danger. The danger is that all of a sudden the power of God and the blessings of God come upon a life, and we've stopped there. But David didn't. David was anointed, 1 Samuel 16, 13. David was anointed again in 2 Samuel 2, 4. And David was anointed again in 2 Samuel 5, 3. That's why he said in the 92nd Psalm, I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Yesterday's oil won't do for today. Yesterday's power won't do for today. Fresh oil. That's what your ministry needs. And that's what your family needs. And that's what your Sunday school class needs. And that's what your church needs. An anointing, not with yesterday's oil, but with fresh oil. I became pastor in the following years of the Miller Road Baptist Church of Garland, Texas. Twenty-one people showed up the first day to vote for me. Eighteen voted for me, two voted neutral, and one voted undecided. I became pastor of that small church. The first Sunday I was there, we had 44 people in Sunday school. On our first anniversary, we had 617. On our second anniversary, we had 1,180. On our third anniversary, 2,212. And on the fourth anniversary, over 3,000 on a big day in Sunday school. But I was a country preacher. The church was too big for me. I didn't know anything about drawing up a church budget. I didn't know anything about administrating a church. I did not know how to be an executive. We had a great budget, great crowds coming. I knew nothing about organization. It got too big. I I became frustrated. I recall on New Year's Eve, 1954, the church was too big. I was worn out. I went to my study, and I said, Dear God, I'm going to resign tomorrow morning. New Year's Day, 1955. This is December 31st, 1954. Before midnight, I said, Dear God, the church is too big for me. I'll give it to somebody else, and I'll start another little church somewhere. I'm just not big enough to handle this big a church. I took a piece of paper, and I began to write a letter. Dear members of the Miller Road Baptist Church, 
I love you as I love my own life. My heart is broken and my eyes are filled with tears as I write this letter. But the church is too big for me. I must resign. Someone who's a bigger preacher must come and take my place. And I'll start again somewhere else and build a little church. I laid that piece of paper on my desk. And then I laid it on the floor. I got on my knees over that paper. At 11 o'clock, New Year's Eve night, 1954. And I said, Dear God, the church is too big. I don't want to leave. But I don't know how to operate a big church. I'm not a big preacher. I don't understand all the intricacies and organization, administration of a big church. I've got to resign. But I said, Dear God, I'll stay on my knees all night long. If you do something for me before 11 o'clock in the morning, I won't resign. But unless something happens and I get fresh oil, I'll have to resign tomorrow morning. I prayed from 11 to 12. I prayed from 12 to 1. About 1.30, there was a knock on the door. I went to the door. One of my deacons, he's in heaven now, but his name was S.O. Barnett. Big, tall fellow. His pajamas were sticking out about four inches underneath the cuff of his trousers. His eyes were filled with tears. And he said, Preacher, what's wrong? The Lord woke me up tonight and told me something's wrong with my preacher. I called your house. They did not know where you were. I rushed to the office. Preacher, God told me something's wrong. What's wrong, preacher? And I said, S.O., read this. He read my letter of resignation. He said, Preacher, you can't leave us. You can't leave us. You want us all to Christ. You're the only pastor most of us have ever had. And I said, S.O., the church is too big for me. I can't stay. The church is too big. I don't know how to operate it. Unless God gives me something I don't have, I've got to leave. He said, let's pray. We fell to our faces. He prayed. I prayed. He prayed. I prayed. He prayed. I prayed. He prayed. I prayed. We prayed from 1, 1.30 to 2. From 2 to 3. From 3 to 4. From 4 to 5. From 5 to 6. The next morning... About the time the sun was coming up on January 1st, 1955. I cannot tell you what happened. I cannot explain it to you. But the peace of God came in my soul. And God said, my son, I'll give you some fresh oil. I looked at S.O. and I said, S.O., guess what? Guess what? I said, I believe God's done it. He said, then you're not leaving? You're not leaving? And I said, no. I took that letter of resignation and tore it into pieces and threw it on the floor. And that so hugged me around the neck. And he said, bless God. And we danced a dance of joy together in praises to God. Oh, the blessings of God that came. Ladies and gentlemen, we've tried our education. And I'm not against it. I have my degrees as you have yours. We've tried our personalities. I'm not against that. I believe God can use personalities. We've tried our special programs and attendance campaigns, and certainly I'm not against that. But there's something most of us have never tried. Fresh oil. Fresh oil. Dear preacher brother, dear Christian friend, who once knew the blessings of God upon your life, there was a day when God's presence was so, so obvious God's power was so present. It's been a long time, hasn't it? Aren't you hungry? Why don't you say today, dear Lord, take up the tangled strands that we have wrought in vain, that by the skill of thy dear hands some beauty may remain. Why don't you fall to your knees before you go to bed tonight or find you a pasture somewhere or a pea patch or a, or a pine thicket or a, a woods or a creek bottom or a, or a river bed somewhere. Get on your face and say, Oh, God, do it again. Fresh oil. In the passing of years, God called me to go to the great Chicago area 
I did not want to go. God said, Jack, I want you to go pastor the First Baptist Church of Hammond. I said, let me walk in the fields. He said, no, walk in the town. But I said, there are no flowers there. He said, there are no flowers, but there's a crown. But I said, the air is thick. There's nothing but noise and din. He wept as he led me back and said, there is more. There is sin. But I said, the sky is black and the fog is veiling the sun. He said, but souls are black and they walk in darkness undone. I beg for more time to be given. He said, my child, is it hard to decide? It will not seem hard in heaven to have followed the steps of thy guide. So I took one look at the fields and cast my eye toward the town. He said, my child, won't you yield and exchange your flowers for a crown? But I said, I'll miss the flowers and my friends will miss me, they say. He said, my child, choose tonight. If I am to miss you, are they? So into my heart came he. Into his hand went mine. And I now walk in a path I once dreaded to see. A path that has become so divine. But I went to the First Baptist Church of Hammond, Chicago area. The mayor of our city attended our church. The president of the downtown bank attended the church. The owner of the biggest department store in the downtown district attended our church. An influential church, but not like me. I was a country preacher. I was a Texas boy. And here I was up in the Chicago area, out of socket. And then troubles came. They didn't understand me. And I did not understand them. And finally... One night at the Bill Rice Ranch in 1960, I went to sleep. Before I went to sleep, or tried to sleep, before I went to sleep, I said, Dear God, I'm going back to Texas. Eight different churches have contacted me asking if I would consider becoming pastor there. And I said before I went to bed that night, I'm going back to Texas. I wasn't made for the north. I wasn't made for the Chicago area. I'm just a country preacher from Texas. But the Holy Spirit would not let me sleep that night. I tossed and tumbled till midnight. And finally I got out of bed and fell on my knees beside the bed. And I said, Dear God, what are you trying to tell me? And the Lord seemed to say, I called you to Hammond, Indiana. That's where I called you. And I said, but God, I don't know what to do. I'm not a big city preacher. And I'm not a northerner. And I don't understand the people. They don't understand me. All night I prayed. I prayed till one, from one to two, from two to three, from three to four, four to five, begging God to let me go back to Texas or do something to me that would make me qualified to stay in Hammond. Begging God to let me go back to Texas or do something to me that would make me qualified to stay in Hammond. About 6 o'clock or 6.30 the next morning as the sun came up across those mountains of the Bill Rice Ranch, all of a sudden, I couldn't tell you. I don't understand it all, but I knew that God had prepared my heart to pastor the First Baptist Church of Hammond. I think I could sum it up by saying with David, I shall be anointed with fresh oil. How long has it been since the breath of God was upon your life? How long has it been since you knew the power of God upon your ministry? How long has it been? Ere you left your room this morning, did you think to pray? In the name of Christ our Savior, did you sue for loving favor as a shield today? And now for these twenty one and a half years, I've been pastoring in the great Chicagoland area. Oh, the blessings of God. How good God has been. Not because I'm a great preacher. Not because I'm a smart person. Because I'm not. I'm just the same little old Jackie boy that used to live down in Dallas, Texas. I'm the same little old powerless country preacher that used to preach in East Texas without any converts. Except for one thing. Fresh oil. That's it. Fresh oil. 
All is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. Lord, send the old time power, the Pentecostal power, thy floodgates of blessing on us for open wide. Lord, send the old time power, the Pentecostal power. Let sinners be converted in thy name, glorified. That's the need you have, preacher. That's the need you have, church. That's the need you have, Sunday school teacher. That's your need, mother. That's your need, dad. That's your need, bus worker. Fresh. Oil. At Daddy's grave. New Year's Eve, 1954. At the Bill Rice Ranch. But now, I'm 54 years of age. I'm no young East Texas preacher again. But I find myself needing that same anointing I've known through these years. Over 50,000 people call me pastor. The Hiles Anderson College to operate. Ten million dollar budget every year. Two high schools. Junior high school. A grade school. I recall a few years ago, we dedicated a new 5,000 seat auditorium. I walked in the room behind the auditorium to follow the choir in. I looked out and saw 9,000 adults packing that building, standing back in the back, sitting in the aisles. And I was scared. I ran back to my office and I said, Oh, God, I'm a country preacher. I'm not a city preacher. I can't do it. I can't do it. They came to get me and asked me to come on to the service. Fresh oil. Fresh oil. Now, what is the purpose of this power, this fresh oil? You see, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus came, lived, died, rose, and ascended, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, that we may have a gospel to preach. Are you listening? We may have a gospel to preach. He placed in the hands of just a few common men, fishermen and common men, the commission of carrying this message around the world. But who's going to believe it? Who's going to believe a man was born of a virgin? Who in Africa and Asia and America and Europe is going to believe a few men from the Middle East who come and say, Jesus was virgin born. He had no earthly father. Preposterous. Unbelievable. Who's going to believe it? Who's going to believe he lived a life without sin? Lips never spoke that which was evil. Ears never heard what God did not want them to hear. Hands never performed a deed they should not have performed. Feet never did walk a path they should not have walked. Who's going to believe that Jesus never sinned? How can we make folks believe that? How can we make them believe that he died and rose from the dead? How can we make folks believe it? God drew a plan. That plan was this. He said, I'll give you somebody to go with you while you tell that story. And that somebody will be the Holy Spirit of God. And while you talk to them and tell the story from without, the Holy Spirit will talk to them from within. And that's why right now while I'm preaching to you and you hear my voice and see my face, there's somebody talking on the inside, isn't there? That's the Holy Spirit. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing to have Him talk from within while you preach from without? Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing to have Him talk from within while you teach your Sunday school class from without? Wouldn't it be an amazing thing to have Him talk from within while you sing your solo in church from without? Wouldn't it be an amazing thing to have Him talk from within while... You witness to an unconverted person from without. That power, ladies and gentlemen, is available to you. Fresh oil. It may not come to you as an experience. In fact, I would advise you, don't even seek an experience. My advice is this. Seven times a day, yield yourself to the Holy Spirit. When you wake up in the morning, 
after breakfast, at mid-morning, after lunch, mid-afternoon, after dinner, and before bedtime. Get on your knees and say, Holy Spirit, I yield myself to you. Then place all around your house, in your office, in your car, in your business, little reminders. Pray for power. Pray for power. And you pray hundreds of times a day for God's power to be upon your life. And then don't expect an experience. Expect that silent one to speak from within while you speak from without. Look at me. You can't account for me. I know great preachers you can account for. They're giant men of talent, ability, men of personality, men with high IQs, men that could head the Eastern Airlines or the Hilton Hotel chain because of their dynamic. But you can't account for me that way. I'm just a little Texas poor introvert reared in a drunkard's home. Ninety-two pounds on my 17th birthday. The church didn't believe it when God called me. One day I found the secret. It's not by might, it's not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. For the sake of your church, for the sake of your children, for the sake of your life, for the sake of your Sunday school class, for the sake of our nation. Be anointed with fresh oil. I'm a little old-fashioned, I know, when it comes to religion and God. Many think I am painfully slow since I walk where my fathers have trod. But I believe in repentance from sin and that Jesus within us must dwell. I believe that if heaven would win, we must flee from the terrors of hell. I'm a little old-fashioned, I know, but God's peace has a home in my soul. I'm telling wherever I go that Jesus is saving and keeping me whole. Save with the psalmist who said, But my horn shall thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may there be a supernatural work of God and our hearts today. And may we know what David knew as we're anointed with fresh oil. In Jesus' name, amen.